Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture video, which is on the complex gamma function, by which I mean this video is about the gamma function where you have a complex number as opposed to just a real number as the input. And so what I'm going to do in today's video is define the gamma function where you have a complex number as the input instead of just a real number. So this is the gamma function as a function of a complex variable. I'm then going to show that from this definition of the complex gamma function, it follows that the gamma function as an integral converges for all complex numbers with real part greater than zero. That's going to be a direct consequence of our definition of the gamma function of a complex variable. But interestingly, it doesn't stop there. We're also going to show that the gamma function can be extended to the entire complex plane. The gamma function has a valid definition for all complex inputs with the exception of zero and the negative integers. And this process of extending the domain of the gamma function beyond the limited domain in which it was initially defined is known as analytic continuation. So how can we extend the gamma function to complex numbers? Well, maybe we should start by remembering what we did in the case of real numbers. We developed the integral definition of the gamma function. Remember, the gamma function is this function that, in some sense, interpolates the value of the factorial on non-integer inputs. And we found that if x is a real number, then gamma of x is the integral from infinity to 0 of the function t to the x minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. And we found that that integral converges if x is greater than 0. So a natural question would be, once we start talking about complex numbers, is what happens if we replace our x, which is a real variable, with a complex number, which we can denote by z? Well, let's replace x with z in this expression and see if we can just make sense of that. So we would write gamma of z equals the integral from infinity to 0 of the function t to the z minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. So it's easy enough to write z in place of x there, but what does this integral actually mean? Well, to think about that, we need to think about what happens when we take a complex function of a real variable. In general, if we have a complex function of a real variable, we'll take our real variable here to be t, then we would write f of t equals u of t plus i times v of t. In other words, this function takes a real variable t as the input, and it gives us a complex number as the output. The real part of that complex number is a function determined by t, that's u of t, and the complex part of the output is a separate function of t, which we can call v of t. So the function is u of t plus i times v of t. So then f of t gives us a complex number as the output whose real part a is equal to u of t and whose imaginary part b is equal to v of t, and this will therefore equal z. So that gives a fairly straightforward meaning to our integral. The integral of f of t dt would equal the integral of u of t plus i times v of t dt. And we can put brackets around u of t plus i v of t. So that will actually equal the sum of two integrals, the integral of u of t dt plus i times the integral of v of t dt. So with that general framework in mind, let's see how this would operate for the gamma function. We'll let our f of t equal t to the z minus 1 times e to the negative t. So this will then equal e to the z minus 1 times the natural logarithm of t. That's just the definition of complex exponentiation times e to the negative t. If that step is at all unclear, please see my earlier video on complex exponentiation. So this will equal e to the a, that's the real part of z, minus 1, plus b times i, that's the imaginary part, times i, times the natural log of t, all times e to the negative t. This will equal e to the a minus 1 times the natural log of t, times e to the bi 
times the natural log of t times e to the negative t. And finally, simplifying this, that first term, e to the a minus 1 times log of t, that would just equal t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t. I'm just grouping the real terms together times e to the i b natural log of t. Okay, I'll just move that to the top line there. This will equal t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t. And for that e to the i b log t, we'll treat that b log t as if it's theta so that we can write e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta, or in this instance, cosine b log t plus i sine b log t. That's just making use of Euler's identity for the e to the i b log t term in that product. So finally, we have gamma of z equals the integral of this function, the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t times cosine of b log t dt, that's the real part of this integral, plus, here's the imaginary part, i times the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t times sine of b log t dt. So let's see if this new definition of the gamma function, which is indeed more general than our initial definition, let's see if it's still valid if we restrict our input z to real numbers. So when we do that, when we treat z as a purely real number, then the imaginary part of z, which is b here, would have to equal 0. So when z is real, b equals 0. Now let's sub 0 in for b into this expression. We'll look at the imaginary part first. We'll look at that second integral. If we let b equal 0 there, then we have sine of 0 log t. Sine of 0 just equals 0. So now we have t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t times 0. That whole expression just equals 0. Meanwhile, if we substitute 0 in for b into cosine b log t in the real part of the integral, cosine of 0 just equals 1. So finally, we get that z is just equal to a here because the imaginary part equals 0. So we have gamma of a equals the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. That's just our definition of the gamma function on a real variable. So we see that the formula works. So now that we've made sense of this definition of the gamma function where we have a complex input, which I'm calling the variable z, we want to check whether this integral expression converges. So I want you guys to recall something that we proved in one of my earlier videos, which is that gamma of x, where x is a real number, converges whenever x is greater than 0, whenever x is a positive number. And if you're not aware of that fact, you can watch my earlier video to see the proof of that. So now we need to think about what happens to the convergence of the gamma function when we have a complex number as our input. Well, for gamma of z, we can write gamma of z equals gamma of a plus bi. a is the real part of z, b is the imaginary part of z. That would then equal the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the a plus bi minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. Now rearranging the terms in that integral, this would equal the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t times t to the i times b, just switching the order of b and i there, dt. And simplifying further, this would equal the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t times e to the i b log t dt. So let's move that expression to the top of the page. And now to prove the convergence of the complex form of the gamma function, this complex integral, I want to just remember a few facts about the convergence of integrals in general. And the first fact to remember is that if I take the integral of a function, say the integral from b to a of f of t dt, and then I take its absolute value, 
that result is always going to be less than or equal to taking the absolute value of the entire function and then integrating it, right? Because taking the absolute value of a function makes everything in the function positive. So the only circumstance in which those two things will be equal is if the function is positive all the time. If the function isn't positive all the time, if I integrate it and then take that absolute value, all those times when the function was negative are going to subtract from the final result. So to put this concisely, the absolute value of the integral of a function is always less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of the function. So let's make use of that fact here. We can write that the absolute value of the integral from infinity to zero of the function t to the a minus one times e to the negative t times e to the i b log of t dt that the absolute value of that integral, which of course is the same thing as saying the absolute value of gamma of z, is less than or equal to the integral from infinity to zero of the absolute value of this function, the absolute value of the function t to the a minus one times e to the negative t times e to the i b log t dt. So I'm going to move that statement to the top line here. But there's an additional fact to remember which is that the absolute value of the product of several complex numbers, or if you wish, the modulus of this product, the modulus of z1 times z2 times z3 times dot 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 all the way up to zn, that the modulus or absolute value of that product is equal to the product of the modulus of each individual term. So it's equal to the modulus of z1 times the modulus of z2 times the modulus of, three th of z3 all the way up to the modulus of zn, which means that the integral on the right-hand side of this inequality here is equal to the integral from infinity to zero of the absolute value or modulus of t to the a minus one times the absolute value of e to the negative t times the absolute value or modulus, if you wish, of e to the i b log t times the absolute value of that differential term dt. Well, I'm going to replace this right-hand integral with this new integral that it's equal to. And now I want to focus on that term in the integrand, the modulus of e to the i b log t. Well, e to the i b log t by Euler's identity equals cosine b log t plus i sine b log t. So if I take the modulus of that term, that would be equal to the square root of cosine squared b log t plus sine squared b log t. Well, cosine squared x plus sine squared x always equals 1 regardless of what x is. So this term, which is actually the only term involving imaginary numbers, cancels out from the integrand. Now, since our domain of integration is the positive real line, the function t to the a minus 1 is always positive, as well as the function e to the negative t. So I don't need the absolute value signs there. I can just write that the absolute value or modulus of gamma of z must be less than or equal to the integral from infinity to zero of t to the a minus 1 times e to the negative t dt, where a is, of course, the real part of z. But that integral on the right-hand side is just gamma of a. So we've discovered a really interesting and important property of the complex gamma function, which is that its convergence depends entirely on the real part of z. Because we have that for all z equal to a plus bi, where a is the real part and b the imaginary part, the modulus or absolute value of gamma of z is bounded by gamma of a. It's always less than or equal to gamma of a. So what are the conditions under which gamma of a converges? Whenever a is a positive number. That means that gamma of z converges for all z such that the real part of z is positive or greater than zero. Okay, this bears repeating. The modulus or absolute value of gamma of z where z is a complex number is less than or equal to gamma of a where a is the real part of z. And again, we know you can watch my previous video on the real gamma function and its convergence, that gamma of a converges for all a greater than zero. Right, for all positive a. And because we saw that the convergence of gamma of z depends entirely on the real part of z, gamma of z converges for all 
complex numbers whose real part is greater than zero. For all z such that the real part of z, which equals a here, is greater than zero. So to draw that graphically, I'm going to draw the complex plane here. So I have my x-axis, my real axis, and my imaginary axis, so x and i times y. The gamma function is going to converge in this entire shaded area. I'm shading it in very sketchily because I have limited graphics production skills here. But what I'm trying to illustrate is that all of these values on the right-hand side of the complex plane are values for which the gamma function will converge. These are all values of z where the real part of z is positive or greater than zero. But you may recall that we were able to extend the domain over which the gamma function for real numbers converges. We were able to extend that domain to include negative non-integer inputs. And how did we do that? We did that by performing integration by parts. And you can watch my earlier video on the gamma function to see how we did that if this is not familiar to you. But for those of you that are aware of this technique, a fair question to ask is, can a similar strategy work for the complex gamma function? Well, we should try it. So here we go. We have gamma of z equals the integral from infinity to zero of t to the z minus one times e to the negative t dt. And just for ease of presentation, I'm going to flip those terms around. This equals the integral from infinity to zero of e to the negative t times t to the z minus one dt. So to integrate by parts, we have to set one of the terms in those products equal to u and the other term equal to dv. So we'll let u equal e to the negative t. And we'll let dv equal t to the z minus one dt. So I'll underline those two things in different colors just for clarity. Now differentiating u, we get du dt equals negative e to the negative t. So the differential du equals negative e to the negative t dt. Integrating dv, we get the integral of dv equals the integral of t to the z minus 1 dt. Therefore, v equals t to the z over z. And if that integration involving complex numbers was unclear to anyone, please see my previous video on the power rule for complex exponents. So I'll just gather those results over to the side. So now we can do our integration by parts. Remembering the general formula that the integral, in this case from infinity to zero, of u of t times dv of t equals u of t times v of t evaluated at the endpoints, evaluated at infinity and zero, minus the integral from infinity to zero of v of t times du of t. So we can plug this in and find that gamma of z equals e to the negative t times t to the z over z, again evaluated at the endpoints at infinity and zero, that's our u times v, minus the integral from infinity to zero of v du of t to the z over z times negative e to the negative t dt, that's our integral of v du there. And now we can evaluate that first term there, taking the limit as t approaches infinity, I'll factor out the one over z in that term, and then e to the negative t becomes one over e to the t, times t to the z, minus, again, one over z will be factored out, one over e to the zero, that's the other boundary, times zero to the z, I'm plugging in zero for t here. Then I have a minus term in the integrand in that second term. So this will be minus minus the integral from infinity to zero of one over z times t to the z times e to the negative t dt. And now that double negative, of course, becomes a plus sign. And I can pull the factor one over z out in front of the integral since it's just a constant. So let me bring that to the top. We have gamma of z equals the limit as t approaches infinity of 1 over z times 1 over e to the t times t to the z minus 1 over z times 1 over e to the 0 times 0 to the z plus 1 over z times the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the z times e to the negative t dt. 
Now, because we're dealing with limits, we want to look at the conditions under which the terms in this expression will converge. So I'll look at them independently. We'll look at the first one, the limit as t approaches infinity of 1 over z times 1 over e to the t times t to the z, which I'll just write concisely here as t to the z over e to the t. And now it should be evident that as t is approaching infinity, t to the z over e to the t is going to equal infinity over infinity, regardless of what constant we choose for z, again, assuming that the real part of z is greater than 0. And so because this is an infinity over infinity type expression, we can apply L'Hopital's rule to evaluate it. And when we successively differentiate the numerator and the denominator of this expression with respect to t, after enough rounds of differentiation, depending on our choice of z, that term will always equal zero in the limit. So if that's not clear, that application of L'Hopital's rule, I actually go through it in detail in my video on the gamma functional equation. So for any of you that aren't following me here on why that term uh, goes to zero in the limit as t goes to infinity, uh, please check that video out. Now there's one caveat here. We have that leading coefficient 1 over z. So this term will only go to zero as long as z does not equal zero, because then we would have 1 over zero, which of course is infinity. So we would have an infinity times zero expression, which we can't evaluate. So this first term again in the expression for gamma of z goes to zero, provided that z does not equal zero. Now this second term in the expression requires some thought. We have the term 1 over z times 0 to the z over e to the 0. Well, the e to the 0 part in the denominator is easy. That just equals 1. So we are left with 1 over z times 0 to the z. Now, because z is a complex number, we have to be a little careful here. So what is the meaning of 0 to the power of z, where z is a complex number? Well, it's useful to remember that that term, 0 to the z, is really the limit as t approaches 0 in the expression t to the z. So we'll evaluate it by looking at the limit as t approaches 0 of t to the z. Well, that equals the limit as t approaches 0 of e to the z log t. And remembering here that z is a complex number, that z can be written as equal to a plus b times i. We can rewrite this expression as the limit as t approaches 0 of e to the a plus b times i, close parenthesis, times the natural log of t, which will equal the limit as t approaches 0 of e to the a times the natural log of t plus b times i, or i times b, times the natural log of t. And that will equal the limit as t approaches 0 of e to the a log t times e to the i b log t. Now a is just a real number, so I can write that this equals the limit as t approaches 0 of t to the a times e to the i times parenthesis b log t close parenthesis. And now I want to consider the modulus of e to the i times b log t as t goes to 0. Well, remember what we saw before. e to the i b log t, that's just cosine b log t plus i sine b log t. I'm going to draw my coordinate axes here. e to the i b log t is actually just represented by the unit circle. Cosine b log t plus i sine b log t. The unit circle has a fixed radius of 1. So the modulus of e to the i times b log t, where b log t would be represented here by theta, the modulus of every point on that circle just equals 1. Okay, Modulus of e to the i theta always equals 1. So the modulus of e to the i b log t, where b log t is represented by theta, equals 1. Now, as t goes to 0, e to the i times b log t, would just travel around and around this unit circle with constant magnitude 1. So this factor, e to the i b log t, just has a constant modulus of 1. It's not actually contributing anything to the size of this limit as t goes to 0. But the term t to the a 
is actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller as t goes to zero. So if we consider what this expression t to the a times e to the ib log t actually looks like, well, the first term in that product, t to the a, is just a real number. So on the complex plane, it just lives somewhere along the x-axis. And it's multiplying a vector of modulus 1 that's making some angle theta with the positive x-axis. So that's denoted here by e to the i b log t. That's our vector of modulus 1 making some angle theta, which is equal to b log t here. So when we multiply these two numbers, when we multiply complex numbers in general, we multiply their moduli and add their angles. Well, the first term has a modulus of t to the a, and the second term has a modulus of 1. So we're going to get a resulting complex number, or a resulting vector, with a length of t to the a. And the angle of the resulting vector just depends on e to the i b log t, because t to the a has zero angle. But, so we saw that as t is going to zero, this theta is always changing, but the length of the resulting vector when you multiply those two terms together is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So basically, it's spiraling around the origin, getting closer and closer and closer to zero. Therefore, we can conclude that the limit as t approaches zero of the product t to the a times e to the i b log t equals zero. And again, we need there to be conditions on z in order for this term to converge. We already saw that the first term diverges if z equals 0, and that's true for this term as well, because we have that leading coefficient 1 over z. So we have a pole in this function at z equals 0. We also encounter a problem with this second term if the real part of z is less than 0, if the real part of z is negative, because then we have 0 to the z, which again equals the limit as t approaches 0 of the expression t to the a times e to the i b log t. If a is a negative number, that would equal 1 over t to the negative a times e to the i b log t. So we have 1 over t to the negative a, and a is a negative number, so that would be 1 over t to something positive. As t goes to 0, this becomes a 1 over 0 type expression. 1 over 0 equals infinity, so again we have a divergence. That's bad. So this second term will go to 0, provided that the real part of z is greater than 0. Then it's not equal to 0, it's not negative, it has to be greater than 0. So the result of this integration by parts is that we have a new expression for gamma of z. Gamma of z equals 1 over z times the integral from infinity to 0 of the function t to the z times e to the negative t dt, again provided that the real part of z is greater than 0. So I'll move that expression now to the top of the screen, and here I want to pause and reflect. That integration by parts was a lot of work. What did we gain from that? Why is this new integral expression for the gamma function of any value? Well, in complex analysis, we want to know where the poles of our functions lie. This expression, gamma of z, equals 1 over z times the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the z times e to the negative t dt, shows us very clearly that gamma of z has a pole. It goes to infinity at z equals 0. So we call that a simple pole, actually. So this seems to be a fruitful enterprise. What would happen if we integrate this expression by parts again? We can let u equal e to the negative t, and dv equal t to the z dt. And if we integrate by parts again, we get, and I'm going to go a little faster here because I do this integration by parts in detail in my gamma functional equation video, gamma of z would equal, here's the uv part, 1 over z times 1 over z plus 1, times t to the z plus 1 over e to the t, evaluated at the boundaries, evaluated at infinity and 0, plus 1 over z times 1 over z plus 1, times the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the z plus 1 times e to the negative t dt. And when we unpack this a little more, I'm going to start by factoring out those constant terms, 1 over z times 1 over z plus 1, and this will be times, open parentheses, the limit as t approaches infinity of t to the z plus 1 over e to the t minus 
0 to the z plus 1 over e to the 0, close parenthesis. This will all be plus 1 over z times 1 over z plus 1 times that integral, the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the z plus 1 times e to the negative t dt. And both of these terms in parentheses go to zero, the first one by L'Hopital's rule, the second by the same reasoning that showed that t to the z goes to zero as t goes to zero. But here we have new conditions because our exponent is not z, but z plus one. It turns out that both of those terms will go to zero, provided that the real part of z is not positive, but greater than negative one. Because as long as the real part of z is greater than negative 1, we avoid the divergence caused by raising t to a negative exponent as we let t go to 0. So as long as the real part of z is greater than negative 1, the only thing that survives cancellation is that remaining integral expression. So we get gamma of z, after a second round of integration by parts, equals 1 over z times 1 over z plus 1 times the integral from infinity to 0 of the function t to the z plus 1 times e to the negative t dt, again provided that the real part of z is greater than negative 1. And now we see that the gamma function actually has poles at two different values, at z equals 0 and at z equals negative 1. And now something even more awesome happens. Before, we saw that the gamma function, as it was originally defined, was only convergent on the right complex half plane. It was only convergent in the region where z has a positive real part. Now, however, we've shown that this expression of the gamma function defines the gamma function in a way that's valid wherever the real part of z is greater not than 0, but greater than negative 1. So we've actually extended the domain over which the gamma function can converge. So I'm going to illustrate that continuation of the gamma function by drawing a new dashed vertical line for imaginary numbers with real part equal to negative 1. And the gamma function is going to converge in this new shaded region wherever the real part of z is greater than negative 1. So our new definition of the gamma function, which we developed from integration by parts, is actually valid over a larger domain. And very importantly, it's consistent with our original definition of the gamma function on the original domain. So if you plug into this expression a value for z with real part greater than 0, you're going to get the same value for the gamma function that you had with the original definition of the gamma function. But this new definition of the gamma function is valid over a larger domain than the original gamma function as we understood it. This new definition of the gamma function essentially extends the domain to complex numbers with real part greater than negative 1 instead of real part greater than 0. And moreover, this new definition of the gamma function shows that the gamma function has poles at z equals 0 and at z equals negative 1. And I've illustrated those poles here with the small purple circles around z equals 0 and z equals negative 1. For my viewers who are more familiar with complex analysis, these are simple poles or poles of order 1. And this process for extending the domain of the gamma function by taking the formula for the gamma function and integrating it by parts, this can be done again and again. Yet another round of integration by parts gives us that gamma of z equals 1 over z times 1 over z plus 1 times 1 over z plus 2 times the integral from infinity to 0 of t to the z plus 2 times e to the negative t dt. And this is going to be valid for all complex numbers z with real part greater than negative 2. So I'm going to draw a dashed line along all the complex numbers with real part equal to negative 2. And I'm going to extend the shaded region representing the region over which the gamma function converges. And by this method of repeated integration by parts, we're able to continue to extend the gamma function bit by bit. And we find when we do this that the gamma function can be extended to the entire complex plane in this manner. And doing so also exposes the poles of the gamma function, which are at 0, and all the negative integers.
And it turns out that this amazing process of performing mathematical operations on a complex valued function to extend its domain isn't a unique feature of the gamma function. Other functions can be extended in a similar manner or using other techniques. And this process is called analytic continuation. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like or subscribe. Thanks again.